All right, good morning, Church of Lake Forest. How you guys doing? All right. Well, stand up and sing with us. We're going to worship our Lord this morning. He's given us everything we need.
Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. Come on, y'all. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in heaven. Amen. That's when death was arrested.
these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never felt me yet Waiting for change to come Your faithfulness I'm 
still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail Your star still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands Welcome to week nine of Joshua. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Joshua chapter, not nine, not 10, not 11. We're going to jump ahead to Joshua chapter 14. Uh, we're making some progress. And next week will be our last week of, of uh, this study in the book of Joshua. I have enjoyed this every single week. I have enjoyed every single message. Um, and it, I feel like every week I say, this is my favorite message from Joshua. But this week, this is my favorite message from Joshua. And, and um, all of you young people sitting in the back, y'all need to keep the noise down at the tables in the back. Yeah, all you people who are under the age of 100, that's, I'm just kidding. I walk past a couple of them. I'm like, I'm going to have to break up the party back here. Y'all are enjoying those tables. I'm glad that we have the new chairs. I'm glad that we have the tables for you to sit around and take notes on. But seriously, this message is for all of you back there in the back. Because it's about a man who's 85 years old. All right, I'm just kidding. None of you, are any of y'all 85? Is anybody in here 85 or older? 80, I don't think we've got anybody now, right now that's 85 or older. All right, so y'all aren't there yet. This is for the old people. You are the young people in the back of the room. All right, I, y'all, yes, amen, amen. But seriously, we're gonna be talking about a man named Caleb this morning who in this story in Joshua 14 is 85 years old. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. This is not a story about a young warrior. This is a story about a seasoned warrior, a man after God's own heart, a man who has certainly seen some battles. But what the Bible tells us about Caleb six times in the book of of Numbers and in the book of Joshua is that he wholeheartedly followed the Lord. I pray, and by the way, that, that's like the one point of the one point message right there, that we should be like Caleb. We should have the spirit of Caleb where we wholeheartedly follow the Lord. I pray that that's, that that's like on, on my tombstone, that that can be 
on your tombstone that you live the kind of lifestyle that you say, that, that people will say about you, he or she wholeheartedly followed the Lord. We could go home right now and not worry about the rest of the message, not worry about what we're going to learn about today. If we would just put that into practice, if we would just become the kind of people who had the spirit of Caleb, who wholeheartedly follow the Lord, our marriages would get better, our finances would get better, our businesses would get better, our church would be full, our kids would, would, would obey. We would have the kind of life that we ultimately want to live if we were just a little more like Caleb. So we're going to dig into Joshua chapter 14 this morning. But before we get there, I was, I was searching around online, <clears throat> and I found something online uh, called the 51 Signs You're Getting Older, large print edition. All right. So I'm not going to read all 51, but I, I picked out a couple. I want to read them to you. Um, you know you're getting older when, number one, everything hurts, and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. All right. I'm at the stage where everything hurts, but it all still works, okay? Uh, number two, the gleam in your eyes is from the sun hitting your bifocals. Now, some of you would normally say the gleam in your eyes is from the light shining off my bald head, but I wore a hat this morning, so you can't claim that, all right? Uh, number three, you know you're getting old when you sit in a rocking chair and can't get it going. Yes, yes. I don't know if any of y'all are there yet. Number four, your knees buckle, but your belt won't. Yeah, I think that hurts somebody's feelings right there. Uh, you know you're getting old, number five, when you sink your teeth into a stake and they stay there. <laughs> Chris, you laughed a little too extra hard at that one. I like it. I like it. Uh, number six, <laughs> you know you're getting old when you're asleep, but others worry that you're dead. <laughs> you know, put the little mirror under your nose, make sure you're still breathing. Uh, number seven, for some of you, everybody knows that you're awake because you're snoring and like the neighbors can hear you, all right? You know you're getting old, yeah, when nobody wonders if you're dead too. Uh, number seven, your back goes out more than you do. Yes, yes. Number eight, you enjoy hearing about other people's operations. How many of you know some old people like to talk about who's going to the doctor, who's got the visits, you know, even my mama was talking recently about all the doctor appointments that they needed to go to over the last couple of weeks. Listen, I'm, I'm getting right there at, with you. I visited the doctor a couple of times lately. All right. Um, you know you're getting older, number nine. I've got 10. Number nine, when people call at 9 p.m. and say, did I wake you? <laughs> yes. You don't have to worry about that with me because my phone goes off at nine and tells me to go to bed, or my, my watch does now. Uh, and then number 10, I shaved mine this morning. You know you're getting older when your ears are hairier than your head. <laughs> yes, yes. Old people, I don't want to admit that some of those apply to me. Some of y'all don't want to admit that they apply to you. I remember talking with my mamma, my, my, my dad's mom, years ago. Um, and I, I, was, I was a kid. I mean, I was probably six, seven. I was a young kid, six or seven, maybe eight years old. And in science class, we were learning about um, like, like how healthy the, the hair in your ear, like your inner ear is. You know, it, it helps clean out the wax and all that kind of stuff. And she said, oh, honey, I don't have any hair in my ears. Like she wanted to make sure that she did not look anything like my papa who was also bald on his head, but had plenty of hair coming out of his ears and, and his nose. She don't have anything to do with that. We don't, like, we don't like getting old. Someone once said that old age is when you've got it all together, but you can't remember where you put it. <laughs> Caleb, that we're gonna talk about this morning, had it all together, and he knew exactly where he put it. He knew exactly where he was taking it. He knew exactly where God wanted him to be. And I pray that as we all get older, while we can laugh at some of those things, the reality is we're all going to get old. Things are going to break. Things aren't, aren't going to keep working on our bodies. They're gonna, you know, we're going to have to go to the doctor to, help, to get help getting some of those things fixed. And the reality is the older we get, some things just can't get fixed. But when we fix our eyes on Jesus and on the will of God and we become wholehearted followers of the Lord... We will know where God wants us to go, and we will follow him there. That's my prayer for all of us this morning. In the Bible, some men stand out above others, right? Like if I say the name of Moses, if you've been in church really at all, you know exactly who Moses is. Moses is, he stands out above, uh, above Joshua. Like he's, he's better known than Joshua, even though Joshua walked places 
where Moses never went, right? I mean, Moses led the people out of Egypt, and he is well known for that and the plagues, and, and, and there have been movies made about, about the Exodus and Moses, you know, crossing the Red Sea. But Joshua is the one who led the people into the Promised Land. And then you've got Joshua. Joshua is much more well-known than Caleb, but it was Joshua and Caleb who delivered the minority report in Numbers chapter 14 when, when Moses sent the 12 spies into the promised land and, and, and 10 came back and said, they're giants, we can't do it, we'll never make it. And two, Joshua and Caleb said, oh no, God's on our side. We, we could, yes, I mean, they're big, but I mean, we've seen God do miracles, let's go. And so even though Joshua was an amazing leader, an amazing soldier, Joshua didn't conquer the giants. Caleb did that. Caleb is the giant slayer that Joshua never was. Listen, there's some of you in this room who you may feel like you're a nobody, like, like nobody knows who you are, or regardless of your age, whether you're older or you're younger, you may, you may have wished that in your life you would have become famous, that, that people would know you, you for, for your great success. Or some of you may be greatly successful, but it's kind of under the radar and nobody ever has ever really found out about it. Nobody ever really knows that. I think some of the, the wealthiest people that I've known in my life, nobody knows, unless you're like a good friend with them. Nobody can just see them because they drive old cars and wear normal clothes, but, but they've got millions of dollars that they just give away to people and support charities and churches and ministry. And nobody knows it. They just kind of fly under the radar. I don't care who you are. If you're the most famous, the least famous, you feel like you want to be somebody someday and, and you finally want to be recognized or maybe you never want to be recognized. Listen, Caleb, Caleb is only mentioned a few times in the Bible. But six times we read about him wholeheartedly following the Lord. That is the spirit of Caleb. I don't care how famous you are or not famous you are, how successful you are by the world standards, or how you just like struggle to make it. Because part of Caleb's life was characterized by just struggling to make it. But if that can be said about you, if you wholeheartedly follow the Lord, then you are somebody. You are somebody in the kingdom that God can use, that God will use, that God will give a destination and a promise to like he gave to Caleb. So let's look at Joshua chapter 14. We're going to read just a couple of verses, and then we're going to come back to Joshua uh, again in just a second. But uh, starting in verse 6. So let me tell you what's happened in verses 1 through 5 real quick. Let me set this up. So the Israelites, they've come into the kingdom. They've, they've defeated several enemies. And now Joshua is dividing. You know, there, there are 12 tribes of Israel. And so Joshua is dividing the promised land. He's dividing Canaan up amongst the 12 tribes and saying, okay, tribe of Benjamin, you get this land over here and you get that land over there and you get this land. And now Caleb is going to stand up and say, hang on a second. I'm going to claim my land to Joshua. So in verse 6, it says, A delegation from the tribe of Judah, led by Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, came to Joshua at Gilgal. Caleb said to Joshua, Remember what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, about you and me when we were at Kadesh Barnea? Okay, Kadesh Barnea is where they were sent out from as the 12 spies. And when they came back and, and delivered the message of God to the people to say, Joshua and Caleb said, no, we should go in and we should fight and we should take over. Israel decided not to go. Remember, God, God punished them. He caused uh, a generation of Israelites to wander around in the wilderness for about 40 years, for a whole generation to pass away that would never get to set foot in the promised land. And at that time, God promised Caleb something. And so Caleb is reminding Joshua, hey, Joshua, you remember that promise that God made, uh, he said to Moses, the man of God, about you and me when we were at Kadesh Barnea, verse 7. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. I returned and gave an honest report. But my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. See, Caleb had this history of bravery. He had a, he had a history of, of wholeheartedly following the Lord, of walking in the power and confidence of God. And he's remembering a day from 45 years prior when God promised him something, when he gave that minority report. As a matter of fact, uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 9, I think this will be up on the screen, it says this, 
Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. This is the report that Joshua and Caleb gave. This is the, you know, we call it the minority report because it was 10 against 2. Joshua and Caleb came back and they said, listen, don't be afraid. Everybody else came back and said, there are giants living in the land. I mean, yes, this is a land flowing with milk and honey, but they've got fortified cities. They've got these great big walls that we're never going to be able to get past. And, and, and it's inhabited by this race of giants, the Anakim, the, the, the sons of Anak, these great big giants who we're never going to defeat them. We look like grasshoppers next to these giants. And Caleb and Joshua came back and said, oh, no, 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 no. They are, they're only helpless prey. So I was reading that verse, helpless prey, and uh, in the NIV, the, tran- the NIV translation of, of this uh, verse says, we will devour them, that they're like food to us. So I looked at that word. As a matter of fact, I've got the Hebrew to throw up there. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I had to ask my dad how to pronounce this word this morning because he is the Hebrew scholar. But that word is lachmanu, lachmanu. Prey. They're like prey. It literally means they're like food or they're like bread to us. So I'm kind of a redneck hillbilly, right? I know about that much French. Probably enough that you shouldn't repeat it. But when I see that word like like described in the in the English, you know, the way that it's written, I just see la menu. Right? And so what Caleb is saying is, listen, guys, they're just the next dish on the menu, right? <laughs> they're like food to us. We should go in. It's no more difficult to defeat them than it is to like order the number four value meal on the McDonald's menu. Let's just go. If God is for us, who can be against us? That's the way that Caleb and Joshua live their lives. And what Caleb knows is true is this, and, and Joshua was the same way, but Caleb knew this too, is that one man plus God equals a majority, which equals victory. Because the reality is God is the majority and he brings the victory. And so even if it's just one man, put Daniel in that place, put four guys or three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You can put Paul in that place. You can put Luke there. You can put, you can put John there. You can put any hero of the Bible. You can put yourself there, man or woman, plus God is a majority and you will have victory. Caleb knew it in Numbers chapter 14, and Caleb knows it in Joshua chapter 14. This is how, gentlemen, warriors, I am fours, this is how a man of God talks. We're going to strap on, kick butt, and take names later. Walking in the confidence of God, this is the way that a man of God ought to act. To know when it's the will of God to charge in and take the land, bring the kingdom, bring, you know, advance the kingdom of God forcefully as forceful men try to lay hold of it. That is what a man of God does, and that's what Caleb does. Some people in this world would like to look at strong, confident men, especially, quite frankly, white, heterosexual Christian males who have some muscle as being examples of toxic masculinity. They would look at Caleb, they would look at Joshua, and they would say that these men are examples of toxic masculinity. That is not how God himself described them. Just a few verses later in Numbers chapter 14, verse 24 in the NIV, it says this, and this is when God is making that promise to Caleb that Caleb, that Caleb is, is collecting on. It says, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. What God is saying about Caleb is this, this guy's a different guy. He's got a different spirit. He's not a big wuss like the rest of you guys, like the other 10 in this group. Now listen, these 10, these were warriors. These were not like little wimps. These were, you know, as strong as an Israelite could be and as warrior-like as an Israelite could be, that's who Moses sent into the promised land as spies to spy it out. But God is saying there's something different about Caleb. And what makes Caleb different? It's not his muscles. It's not his swagger. Although Caleb has muscles and swagger, it's the fact that he wholeheartedly follows the Lord. That 
is the spirit of Caleb. That is the spirit that we should all have. Right now, especially in America, but around the world, we see it where people want to raise up certain issues to, to the position of primary importance. What is primarily important is your, in your life is that you wholeheartedly follow after the Lord, that Jesus is your Savior, that God is your leader, that the Holy Spirit is your guide, and that in the spirit of Caleb, you are going to wholeheartedly follow the Lord. But what the world is telling us is that things like race should be of primary importance. Race is not the most important thing. Nationality. You know, we want to look at, at critical race theory and pull that down and drag that down. But then we want to be such patriots that, quite frankly, some of us put our nationality, our patriotism, above God. That's not of primary importance. Gender, your pronouns, I'm sorry, if you're a he, you're a he, if you're a she, you're a she. And there is plural, not singular. I'm sorry, but that's just the way that it is. Your sexuality, your gender, that's not of primary importance. Are those things important? Yes. Should we have conversations about those things? Yes. As a matter of fact, parents especially, but for everybody, if you're not on Facebook, you, don't, you didn't see it on Facebook, if you want to text me, I can send you a link, but I posted on Facebook yesterday an amazing guide. It's kind of long, but it's not a whole book, a little booklet about uh, arming yourself as a Christian to have some conversations about the LGBTQ plus, minus, zer, whatever conversation. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't make fun of it, but sometimes I just have to. They just keep adding letters and pluses, and then it makes people mad when their, letters, when their letter isn't in there. But download that, that guide. It's a great conversational piece. We want to make our marital status primarily important. Our, maybe it's our economic status for some of us. That's the most important thing in our lives is, is how much money we make, and are we making more than the guy down the street or the competitor or whatever. In fact, we want to make religion the most important things in our most important thing in our life and that's still not what is primarily important the most important thing in our lives is Jesus it's wholeheartedly following the Lord it's living a lifestyle like Caleb is living and has lived now for 85 years this cat is on fire for God and he's about to go take a mountain because he's an 85 year old dog on it and I'm still young enough to do it that's what he's saying <laughs> we want to exalt everything above God but but God says God says this uh, in in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 the New Testament teaches us to seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I know some of y'all sang that song like when I was in middle school and high school, right? Seek first the kingdom of God. Be like Caleb. And all these things will work themselves out. I promise you, if you seek after God's will, you'll know what you need to know about sexuality, gender, race, the kingdom, religion, finances, Come in a couple weeks when we kick off this, this Suns Out, Guns Out series, I'm going to talk about a few of those, not all those things, but a few of those things. Because I want you to grow in your faith in those areas. But most importantly, I want you to have the spirit of Caleb. If you haven't written it down yet, write down the spirit of Caleb equals a wholehearted follower. That's what we all need to have is the spirit of Caleb to be a wholehearted follower. So what does that look like? I want to lay out a few things for you and, and, and for us to learn what that looks like from the life of Caleb. Let's read the rest of Joshua chapter 14. It'll be up on the screen in the New Living Translation. Verse 9. So that day Moses solemnly promised me, this is still Caleb speaking. So on that day, 45 years ago, Moses solemnly promised me, the land of Canaan on which you were just walking will be your grant of land and that your descendants forever because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. Verse 10, now as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well, as he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made this promise. Even while Israel wandered in the wilderness, today I am 85 years old. Happy birthday, Caleb. Verse 11, I am as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on that journey, and I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. So give me the hill country that the Lord promised me. You will remember that as scouts... We found the descendants of Anak living there in great walled towns. But if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land, just as the Lord said. 
So Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave Hebron to him as his portion of land. Hebron still belongs to the descendants of Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, because he wholeheartedly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Previously, Hebron had been called Kiriath Arba. It had been named after Arba, a great hero of the descendants of Anak. And the land had rest from war. Number one, Caleb never released God's promise. Caleb never released God's promise. For 45 years, 45 years before, God had promised Caleb, hey, that land that you just walked on, when you went in and you were a spy with those other 12 spies and you came back and you gave the minority report and you said, boys, let's strap on and let's go in and nobody else wanted to go, God promised Caleb that the, the, where his foot fell, the land that he walked on, this, this mountain of Hebron, this hilly country, that's going to be yours. And for 45 years, Caleb has held on to that promise. He's not forgotten. He hasn't released it. Listen, there are promises that God gives us today. I will never leave you or forsake you. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ's glory. Right? God is, is with us. We are God's nation. The kingdom that he has founded in our hearts and the promises that God has made to the nation of Israel and to the nations and to individuals. Not every single promise applies to us, but the vast majority of them do. God has made so many promises to us to keep us, to guide us. And it's important that we hold on to those promises and that we, that we model those things to our kids so that they will learn it from us. And listen, it was important to Caleb because it was important to his dad and his granddad and his great-granddad and his great-great-great-granddad. All the way back to Abraham, it was important that God kept this particular promise to Caleb today. Because God blessed Abraham with some money about 500 years before. And about 500 years before Caleb lived, Abraham bought a little piece of property. And on that little piece of property, he buried his beautiful wife. And on that same piece of property, some other leaders like Abraham, I already mentioned Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Leah, they were all buried in this family tomb. And guess which mountain that little plot of land was on the side of? Hebron, the hill country that God had promised to Caleb and that Caleb was claiming, he was holding on to the promise of God that God was gonna give it back to the people of Israel, that was, God was gonna give it back to Caleb and to his family and that it was going to stay in the possession of the descendants of Abraham forever. This place still exists today. If you go to the Middle East today, you can go and you can visit this cave. As a matter of fact, um, it's a site of controversy today between the Jews and the Muslims. The Muslims lay claim to it. The Jews lay claim to it. I think right now Israel has control of it. But you can visit today, and it's considered by the Jews to be the second holiest place in the world outside of the Temple Mount that is hugely controversial between Jews and Muslims today. God always keeps his promises. It was important to Caleb not to release that promise. Parents, it's important for us not to release those promises, to walk in the promises of God so that our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids will walk in the legacy that we leave behind. Caleb was walking in the legacy of Abraham and all of those leaders who had gone before him. And it was important for him to hold on to that legacy. Yes, he was different and things changed. Like at the church at Lake Forest, things have changed over the last 30 years. Things have gotten different. But we remember where we came from. We remember those who, who paid with blood, sweat, and tears for this building and with their money for the, for, for the things that we have today. And there is a tradition that we hold on to and that we will never give up. Jesus and his word. Jesus saves. We've preached it at this church from day one, and I'll continue to preach it today. We need to live that promise in our households like Caleb did. Caleb said, I want that mountain because God had promised it to him. 
and he never released the promise of God. Number two, Caleb never retired from God's service. He never released God's promise and he never retired from God's service. Six times in Numbers and Joshua, we're told that Caleb wholeheartedly served the Lord. I've already said that to you. Over and over and over again, Caleb served God. He walked in the will of God. You know, it's been said that, that m most successful business owners, that most successful leaders are as successful as they are because they have this like, this, this, this laser point drive, this, this one overarching goal that their whole business is, is based off of, their whole model. There's, there's a couple of different leadership models um, that talk about what this, what this goal is. Uh, one calls it the WIG, the W-I-G, or the wildly important goal, right? There's another one that I've studied that calls it the BHAG. BHAG, I like that one a little bit better than WIG, the BHAG. But it's the, uh, the, the BHAG, I, I went blank. It's the big, hairy, audacious goal, right? The big, hairy, audacious goal. And basically, you know, what you, what you learn when you study leadership and you study business is whatever that big, hairy, audacious goal is, if you put the vast majority of your money, your time, your effort into reaching that goal and you're moving in that direction, then most of the little things around you are going to fall into place, right? That you should spend at least 80, maybe 90% of your time, you should spend 80% of your time, of your finances, of your resources, getting to what builds 80% of your business. For Caleb, his BHAG, his big, hairy, audacious goal was very simple, wholeheartedly following the Lord. Let that be our goal in life, to wholeheartedly follow the Lord. It's what made him strong. He was single-minded. James writes about being single-minded and about not being Double-minded in James chapter 1. I don't have this on the screen But but you can go back and read it for homework if you want to in James chapter 1 James writes that when we go and we pray to God and we're asking God for wisdom that we should be single-minded that we shouldn't be Double-minded that we shouldn't like, you know, be be trying to figure out from from wisdom standpoint We're not like taking a, an opinion poll, right? That, that wisdom from God doesn't rely on on opinion polls we're, We can't be easily swayed to the left and to the right or over over overthrown by every whim and, and wind of the world that would blow us left and right, but instead we should be single-minded because God says in James 1, what James writes is that he won't bless those. He won't, why, why, why should we expect anything from God if we keep kind of swaying to the left and to the right, if we're not single-mindedly loyal to God and wholeheartedly following him? We should be stable in everything that we do. Caleb didn't follow polls. Caleb never retired from God's service. I'm certain that until he took his last breath, he wholeheartedly followed the Lord. We don't, in the church, we don't need more nice Christians to water down the gospel. I'm not telling you to be mean, and I, I don't think we should be weird Christians either. But it should be okay for us to call sin, sin, in the church, as Christians. I don't mean just okay, I mean like when, when, when the world is different from the word, we 100% of the time go with the word. That's what Caleb has been the definition of his entire life, this single-minded, wholehearted following the will of God. The spirit of Caleb is what we need today. It's as if he was already channeling what Joshua will write about later and we'll talk about next week as for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Boys, let's strap on and get ready to rumble. I may be 85, but we're going to go take them out. Number three. Number three. Caleb never retreated from God's enemies. Caleb never retreated from God's enemies. Moses was a great leader, but Joshua walked where Moses never walked. Joshua was a great soldier, but Caleb fought enemies that Joshua would never fight. Those Anak, those Anakim, Caleb was the giant slayer. In Joshua chapter 14, verse 12, I think this will be on the screen. We just read it. Uh, he says to, Caleb says to Joshua, so give me the hill country that the Lord promised me. You will remember that as scouts, we found the descendants of Anak, the Anakim, Goliath of Gath that David fights generations later. He was a descendant of Anak. He was one of the Anakim. As, uh, as a matter of fact, as you study like uh, the life of Goliath, apparently there were at least five giants in his family. And one of them that, that we read about in some other sources 
um, the, the way that the words are translated, that he had like six fingers and six toes on every hand and every feet. Not only was he 10 feet tall, he had extra digits, right? Not Goliath, but one of his brothers. These were big dudes, right? I don't know if you've ever met a Jewish person, but I don't know too many really big Jewish people. They tend to be a little bit shorter. I don't know, maybe it's different today than it was then, but, but they, for whatever reason, they're a little smaller. And Caleb doesn't let that hold him back. He does not retreat from an enemy, not because he's big and bad, although without a doubt, Caleb is big and bad, right? He's been a great warrior. He's fought great battles. He doesn't retreat from the enemies because, again, he is wholeheartedly following the Lord. If God said to Caleb, I'm going to give you this country and you're going to defeat, defeat the people there, then Caleb knows God's going to give me this country and I'm going to defeat the people there. He's kept me alive for 45 years. I probably should have died back at Jericho. I probably definitely should have died back at AI. I wasn't one of the 36 guys that died then. I should have died in many of the battles along the way. I probably should have died in the wilderness, but God promised me that I am going to get this hill and doggone it, I'm 85 years old and I'm going to go take it. He never backs down from a challenge. Let's not be Christian wimps. Let's not be the kind of church people, regardless of our age, who ever back down from a challenge. Caleb's strength never failed because his God never forgot. Caleb's strength, he was still strong because God was still with him. Caleb's strength never failed because his God never forgot the promise that he would make to Caleb. God is a God of promises. He never forgets his promises. He will be with us when he says that he will be with us. And so we can meet any enemy head on. If you're not dead, God's not done. I think we didn't sing that this morning. That's in one of the other songs. We sang about some other stuff this morning, about taking a mountain and about, uh, about breaking the walls down. If we're not dead, God's not done. For all of you sitting at the tables in the back, and some of y'all sitting up here, like right up here on the front row. <laughs> not the beautiful woman with the white hair, but the old dude sitting next to her, because he's way older than she is. If you're not dead, God's not done. If you're still breathing, so... Uh, our kids have been, well, we've got four kids. We've, been, we've had three in soccer and one in baseball over the last year. And, uh, and our three playing soccer, a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago, we were watching a soccer game. And the weirdest thing happened, right? So there's a lot of action on a soccer field. I don't know if you're soccer fans, but man, that ball moves like crazy. And I don't remember if we were watching a middle school game or a high school game. But by the time you get into middle school, especially high school, like that ball is moving. And there's, there's all kinds of action on the field. And so a couple of weeks ago, we're watching a game. And, and the ball rolls like just past the goal. And it looks like it goes out of bounds and everybody on the field agrees that the ball went out of bounds. But right as it went out of bounds, the goalie picks it up and he comes and he puts it on the corner of the, of the little goalie box to do a goal kick. That's like what you're supposed to do when the ball goes out of bounds at the goal line. You put it on the, in the goalie box and the goalie kicks the ball off the ground to restart play. Everybody stops play. The goalie puts it in place. He takes a couple of steps back. And then one of the girls on our team, because it, it went out of bounds, one of the girls on our team, she runs up to the ball and she kicks it in the goal. And everybody's like, what in the world? Why would she do that? That was so stupid. We knew it went out of bounds and he's about to do a goal kick. Referee never blew the whistle. If the ref doesn't blow the whistle, the action is not over. As far as she was concerned, that ball never went out of bounds because a whistle was never blown. Now the referee blew his whistle at that point, did not give her the goal, and the goalie got to do his goal kick because ultimately it's always up to the referee. She played through the whistle. Every sport that you play where there's a whistle, every coach will teach you, play through the whistle. You keep pushing, you keep going until the referee blows the whistle, you don't stop. And that's what that girl was doing. In baseball, one of the hardest things for young baseball players to, to like drill in their minds and coaches coach them on it over and over and over again. Uh, George is nine years old. He's on a nine and 10 year old team been playing baseball for a few years now and still kids on his team, forget this, run through the base, run through first base. The place where you're most likely to get out in baseball is at first base. It's going from home to first and they get thrown out there all the time. Why? Because they're running as fast as they can and right before they get to the base, they sort of slow down and they stop right? But the one place that you can run past the base and not get out is on first base. And so baseball coaches teach their kids, run through the base, run through the base, run right past it. You're supposed to curve off, you know, to the right, but, but keep running. Don't stop. Don't get out. Listen, 
That's what Caleb models for us. Play through the whistle. Run through the base. Don't stop. Never retreat from the enemies of God. And what is the result? Because I've been saying the whole time that we should have the spirit of Caleb, this, this, this man who wholeheartedly followed the Lord. What is the end result of all of Caleb's efforts? Did y'all catch it? The end of Joshua chapter 14, the last few words of the chapter. And the land had rest from war. The land had rest from war. The spirit of Caleb ultimately results in peace. You want peace in your family? You want peace for your kids? You want to you wanna model the kind of life that you, you work hard in your life so that maybe your kids will learn from your mistakes and not have to work quite as hard as you do and that the land will have peace? Model the spirit of Caleb. Play through the whistle. Was Caleb's life easy? Was it, was it easy for him to go take that mountain? I don't think so. The Bible doesn't give us the whole story, but he had to go defeat some giants. He had to become a giant slayer. And ultimately, he defeated the giants. The, the, the land was named something different because Caleb took it over, and the land experienced peace, rest from war. We are not promised that this life will be easy. But we are promised that when we wholeheartedly follow the Lord, that God will bless us with the peace that passes all understanding. Some of you may be kind of like me and, and think, well, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm only half of Caleb's age. I'm only 43, so I'm not old like some of y'all are, all right? But I read this story differently at 43 than I did at 23. And sometimes I wonder, like, so because I screwed up so much at 20 and 21 and 22 and 23, does that mean God's not going to bless me the same way at 43? Or maybe some of you are thinking, well, when I was in my 30s and I was in my 40s, is God not going to bless me? I, I wasn't as strong in the Lord. I, 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 maybe you weren't even a Christian. Maybe you weren't even walking with God 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And because I wasn't a warrior like Caleb was for my whole life, is God going to bless me at the end of my life? Let me remind you of this. Do you remember what's happening in the first five verses of Joshua chapter 14? The kids and grandkids of all those wusses who wouldn't go into the promised land, you know what they got? The promised land. God keeps his promises even when we don't. God blessed the entire nation of Israel, not just Caleb. Now, Caleb stood head and shoulders above everybody else. Caleb got a mountain that nobody else got because nobody else was like Caleb. You may be the kind of person who is the standout, who is the model Christian, who is the best father, the best mother. But my guess is you're probably not. I'm not. Yeah, I'm the pastor here, but my fan don't talk to my kids. They know the things that I say and do that I shouldn't. We are a place where no perfect people are allowed. And that is not a license to sin. That is not an excuse to go and do whatever the hell you want to. But what it is is a reminder that God loves you in spite of the hell within you. That God will keep his promises to you even when you act like hell and not heaven. That you're a, a citizen of another kingdom instead of a citizen of the kingdom of God. God loves us in spite of ourselves. But let us be the kind of people who have the spirit of Caleb. Let us run the kind of race. Let us, let us fight the kind of fight where we fight through the whistle. We run through the base. We never stop going regardless of our age so that when people remember us, they remember us as a people, as individuals who wholeheartedly followed the Lord. When we do that, when we do that, this church will grow, our families will be stronger, this community will be different, just like that community was different. Things were different in the promised land in Canaan because Caleb walked there. Be the kind of man that where you walk, 
Things are different. Be the kind of woman that when you go into a place, it's different because you are wholeheartedly following the Lord. Let me pray for you this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we want to see peace in our land. God, we, we desire your will in our church. We desire to see the promises that you have given us come to fruition. God, I'm looking forward to the day when you keep the promise that you are going to send your son again. That he will come back and we will see him on the clouds and he will gather the church unto himself. That the dead in Christ will rise first. And that the rest of us will be caught up into the clouds. God, I'm looking forward to that day. I don't want it to come tomorrow, but I want it to come pretty soon. Because God, I believe that you're the kind of God who will keep his promises. God, I'm looking forward to the day when my kids will be leaders in this church and other churches. They're already becoming young leaders. But God, I'm looking forward to the day when they're standing on the stage, when they're visiting the sick in the hospitals, when they're carrying a group of teenagers to camp. God, I'm looking forward to the day when grandkids are walking in the legacy that my grandparents left behind for me. And God, I pray that for my church, for your church, for the church at Lake Forest, for everyone who's gathered here in this room this morning, for those who are watching online. God, I pray that the legacy that we would leave behind would be the spirit of Caleb, that we would be parents and grandparents, young adults, teenagers, who are wholeheartedly following the Lord. God, today is the day that if we're not doing that, it can change. That you've also promised that you sent your son Jesus, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God, you've promised that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, you've told us that we can give our burdens to you and that we can take your yoke of love and forgiveness and grace and mercy on us because that burden is easy to carry. It is light. God, that we can bring the burden of our addictions to you. We can bring the burden of our broken relationships to you. We can lay them at your feet and you will heal us. You will forgive us and you will bring peace to our families. You'll bring, pre bring peace to our households, to our lives. God, this morning we claim those promises. And God, I pray a blessing over this church that as we make the decision to walk as Caleb walked, to have the spirit that Caleb had, that God, when we see giants, we won't turn and run. When we see problems in our lives, we won't be content to just suffer through the problem. But that God, we will conquer it in your power. Not because we're big and bad, but because we know any one of us plus you equals victory. God, we know that any one of us plus you equals the power to conquer the world, to conquer the, the chaos in our minds, to conquer the chaos in our bodies, to conquer the chaos in our marriages. God, you have made us more than conquerors. And you work all things together for the good of those who love you, who are called by your name. God, I pray those promises over my church this morning, over your church, over those that you have called, my brothers and sisters in Christ, my family at the church at Lake Forest. God, bless us this week. Bring us back together. Keep our kids safe as they travel to camp. And God, for those who are struggling this morning, I just pray that they give that struggle to you and that they follow your will. Jesus, we love you and thank you and praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here this morning. You are dismissed. Have a great week.